I'm Jenna Miscavige. I was born and raised in Scientology. I left when I was 21 years old and wrote a book about it. My uncle, David Miscavige, is the leader of Scientology. And this is my YouTube channel. Hey guys, so today I thought it would be interesting to have a chat about the fact that despite there no longer being cadet orgs in Scientology, why I still find it important to talk about what it was like growing up inside the cadet org. So for those of you who don't know, the Sea Org is Scientology's most dedicated and elite group where members sign one billion year contracts dedicating themselves lifetime after lifetime to Scientology. The Sea Org is a paramilitary organization with demanding schedules, demanding conditions, strict rules, and little to no pay. And the loyalty to Scientology is absolute at this level. The Cadet Org is Scientology's youth division of the Sea Org. It was created for children of Sea Org members, and basically these children are raised to become Sea Org members themselves. The Cadet Org is also run in a paramilitary style, and there are long hours of heavy labor, minimal schooling, and it is basically to prepare these kids, of which I was one, to become Sea Org members for the rest of their lives. These cadet orgs no longer exist. I'm not sure what Scientology's exact reason was for having them no longer exist. I can imagine it wasn't because they all of a sudden had good feelings towards children and didn't think they deserved these conditions. Um, at least if that is the reason, they've never apologized to any of the children or um, done anything to make it better in any way. They've really just gone out of their way to make people who grew up in Scientology's lives harder when they try to speak about their experiences there. Um, but I know that there was still a cadet org in LA in about 2002. Um, but there was a cadet org. There were two cadet orgs in California. There was one in Clearwater, Florida. There was one in the UK. And there was one in Curacao. And there were probably a couple of others that I'm not aware of. But those are ones that I am definitely aware of. And um, they phased those out. But one thing I want to make clear is that just because they phased out these cadet orgs, it does not mean that all of the kids who were in the cadet orgs were 18 at the time when the cadet orgs were phased out. Meaning, what they actually did was put an end to the cadet orgs and they had all of those kids come into the Sea Org or send them elsewhere, but for the most part, they came into the Sea Org. So in 1999, all of the cadets that were at the cadet org that I was at were sent to Clearwater, Florida and basically put on as workers and um, most of whom were ages of anywhere from 13 um, up until 17. But these were minors and they were put directly onto jobs working 115 hours per week for the SEA organization. Now the reason I still talk about this even though Scientology is not currently involved in the raising of children directly, or I should say the Sea Org is not involved in the raising of children directly, is because just because that aspect of it is not still happening, it doesn't mean that it did not happen and that those things do not need to be addressed. That is because the things that went on at the ranch, which range from deprivation of education, uh, illegal child labor, separation from parents, teaching kids to have shame for things that they have no reason to have shame for, putting kids in a position where they have no one who is protecting them or looking out for them or has their best interests at heart or cares about who they are in the world, who they want to be. That has effects on people and those effects are long term. In the many years since I've left Scientology in the Sea Org, I've learned a lot about how the things that happen to you in childhood affect you for your whole life. I wanted to share this little clip um, because I think that it is so interesting and so telling. CDC and Kaiser Permanente discovered an exposure that dramatically increased the risk for seven out of 10 of the leading causes of death in the United States. In high doses, it affects brain development, the immune system, hormonal systems, and even the way our DNA is read and transcribed. 
Folks who are exposed in very high doses have triple the lifetime risk of heart disease and lung cancer and a 20-year difference in life expectancy. And yet doctors today are not trained in routine screening or treatment. Now, the exposure I'm talking about is not a pesticide or a packaging chemical. It's childhood trauma. I want to give a little analogy because I think it might make it a little bit easier for people to understand where I'm coming from on this point, which is, let's just say somebody, uh, a little girl gets sexually abused as a child. And this is something that happens one time and she grows up and she never speaks about it. She knows about it in the back of her mind and she, it affects the way she trusts people. It affects the way she um, exists in her relationships. Um, it gives her a certain amount of shame about herself. It gives her a certain amount of distrust. And then one day she decides that she needs to talk about it in order to get rid of all of these feelings that she has surrounding it and to get it off her chest. And maybe even she doesn't even realize that this happened because she had to block it out in order to survive until after she's already an adult. And... In that situation, it's something that she may feel that she needs to voice in order to stop talking to herself in a certain way or in order to stop accepting a certain type of treatment from people or in order to feel less powerless, in order to feel more in control of her story and her own narrative. Now, nobody would tell her at that point when she's speaking about what happened to her that you're not currently being sexually abused by this person so why would you bring it up now? Why would you talk about it now? And that's because it is very well known and understood that incidents like that you carry them with you for the rest of your life. And that is why I talk about the things that happened in Scientology when I was a kid. The things that happen to you as a child, they affect you for your entire life. Your attachment style, it affects you in your relationships, your marriages, your friendships. It affects you in the way you deal with anxiety. It affects how you feel about yourself. It affects your shame or lack thereof. These are things that are impossible to avoid if you grow up in the way that we did in Scientology. And all of these people still exist in the world. At the cadet org that I was at, there was 85 kids, you know, there's at least five other cadet orgs. That's hundreds of people in the world who have had similar experiences to me and many even worse that are still living with the effects of this trauma and I feel that in some way me talking about it helps to end the cycle of them potentially gaslighting themselves of them bringing shame onto themselves um, it um, especially when Scientology has never apologized for these things, has never taken any responsibility for it whatsoever has never tried to make good on it at all in fact, to the contrary, in many cases, when these kids who grew up in Scientology, who are no longer kids, who are adults, they remain disconnected from their family because Scientology will not allow them to speak to their family members who still remain in Scientology. And so Scientology is continuing to hurt them in innumerable ways. Some that are obvious, such as disconnection or Scientology posting lying, slanderous websites about them when they try to speak out and tell their truth, and some that are less visible. The effects of the shame, of the stress, of the lack of sleep that they had for years, of their 
adrenal system always being wired for fight or flight because they never know how their senior is going to act that day or what they're going to be in trouble for or if the boss is going to be in a bad mood. We all have had to adjust to living life in that way and have our own coping mechanisms that we deal with every day, whether we know it or not. And these things take time to heal from. And in my case, my first step in healing from it is to acknowledge what happened and, and hoping that my doing so will help other people be a little bit less fearful to acknowledge what happened to them as well. Of course, when you're in the cadet org, when you're in the moment, you have to tell yourself, oh, everything was fine. It was great. Um, I love it here. You have to tell yourself that in order to be in order to survive. What are your options? You're not going to leave. Your parents are there. You're not going to fight people there. There's a whole organization of people who are enforcing these rules. You can't win. So your only option when you're there is to tell yourself that this is okay, this is right, and to fall in line. And so you create coping mechanisms, you create disassociations in order to deal with that. That basically can come back and haunt you later on in adulthood when you're just trying to get on with your life. I'm not sure if I'm going to explain this concept that I have coherently. It's, it's just an opinion that I have about something, which is sometimes I feel like, you know, if people were to see kids in there right now that this is happening to, it would be like, oh, we need to save those kids immediately. And, um, this is an emergency and we need to do this right now, which is very valid and um, understandable. And I think I've already butchered explaining it, but anyways, but my point is that there are plenty of people who are adults who that did happen to, who are living in the world right now, who are no less important because they are adults. Just because adults aren't as cute as kids or are technically not as helpless, it doesn't mean that they're any less important than kids. And that actually took me a long while to realize that especially for years when I dedicated so much of myself to my kids in, an, in a coping mechanism in order to, um, in order to make up for my own childhood, in order to soothe myself. And of course my kids are the most important thing in the world to me, but I actually had to realize that if we are talking logically, there is no reason why my kids are more important than me. And in order to be a good parent, I need to be good to myself because I am important because I am my kid's mother, and because I am important for the same reasons that my kids are important. And just to follow that same logic, the adults who have experienced these abuses in Scientology are just as important as the kids who may be experiencing them right now. And I'm saying this because, and this is especially true because these adults who experience these abuses as children, they grew up in Scientology. Now you can say an adult has an option to leave, and um, but they don't. They only grew up know knowing one way of life, knowing one thing. It's not the same as somebody who is an adult in the outside world. It's like we did not have access to the internet. We did not have access to phones. We did not have access to anything that would have told me there was a different way of living or that the way that I was living wasn't normal. And so I think that I may have made this concept a little bit messy um, and confusing. I, I couldn't find the exact words I needed to explain it, but what I'm trying to say is that just because people are no longer kids does not mean they are unimportant. Their happiness and their lives are very, very important. And that's one of the reasons why, even though the cadet org does not exist anymore, I think it is very important to still talk about 
the subject of what it was like growing up in Scientology. Another reason is because even though the cadet orgs don't exist, there are still laws in existence today that allow this type of thing to happen. The laws do not prevent Scientology from creating a cadet org again tomorrow. They have protections because the schools they create are religious schools, which pretty much means that they can get away with almost anything. I want to give you an example here of how Scientology is able to get away with not educating kids and how it was acceptable that basically all 85 kids at the cadet org that I grew up with, none of them got a high school diploma. I want to show how this is currently sanctioned by our own government to show that this could happen again at any time and for all I know is happening. This is a conversation I had with ChatGPT. In California, are religious schools required to issue their students a diploma? Answer. No, in California, religious schools are not required by law to issue diplomas to students. Diplomas are typically issued at the school's discretion based on its curriculum and standards. Question. Are religious schools required to spend a certain amount of time teaching certain subjects that would set a child up for life? Answer. No, California does not require religious schools to spend a specific amount of time on certain subjects. These schools have broad discretion over their curriculum and may not follow state standards that public schools do. So a religious school in California can essentially teach whatever they want and the kids could have a subpar education and there isn't anything that can be done about this. Answer. Yes, in California, religious schools have significant freedom over their curriculum, so they can technically offer an education that may not meet public school standards. There is limited state oversight, so families would have little recourse if the education provided is subpar. What about the child as far as recourse? For the child, recourse is limited. They might seek additional education options later, such as GED programs or community college courses to meet standard educational benchmarks. Legal action is unlikely unless there's evidence of extreme neglect or harm, as courts typically uphold parental rights to choose religious schooling. And if there's evidence of extreme harm or neglect, what would the child's recourse be? If there's evidence of extreme harm or neglect, the child, often through an advocate or guardian, could report it to Child Protective Services or seek legal intervention. This might lead to investigations, alternative educational placements, or legal action to ensure the child's well-being and access to proper education. And what would the statute of limitations be on this? In California, the statute of limitations for child abuse or neglect claims typically extends until the child is 18, plus an additional three years to file a claim as an adult. However, specific time frames can vary based on the type of harm and whether it's classified as abuse or educational neglect. I see. How about in Florida? In Florida, the statute of limitations for child abuse or neglect claims usually extends until the child turns 18, with an additional seven years to file a claim as an adult, or four years from when the abuse is discovered, whichever is later. For cases of educational neglect specifically, recourse is often limited, as Florida, like California, grants private and religious schools broad discretion over their curriculum. And in Florida, in a religious school, are children required to attend school for a certain number of hours per week? No, in Florida, religious schools are not required to follow the same attendance or hourly requirements as public schools. They have significant autonomy over the schedules and curriculum, so they aren't mandated to provide a specific number of hours of instruction per week. So in Florida, a minor child could go to school for one hour a week and the religious school would not be breaking any law. Yes, technically a religious school in Florida could operate with very limited instructional hours without violating state law. As Florida does not impose specific attendance or hourly requirements on private or religious schools, the state grants these schools considerable freedom and yes, technically a religious school in Florida could operate with very limited instructional hours without violating state law, as Florida does not impose specific attendance or hourly requirements on private or religious schools. The state grants these schools considerable freedom in determining their educational structure. Does the government have any oversight? with regards to religious schools in Florida? 
In Florida, government oversight of religious schools is minimal. The state does not mandate curriculum standards, attendance requirements, or specific teaching hours for religious schools. Oversight typically focuses on basic health and safety regulations, and there is little to no regulation on the educational content or quality provided by these schools. I see, and how about in California? Similarly, in California, government oversight of religious schools is very limited. The state does not enforce curriculum standards, attendance, or teaching hours for religious schools, focusing instead on health and safety compliance. Educational content, quality, and instructional time are largely at the discretion of the schools and their governing bodies. There are also many things that happen in Scientology that involve children that, even though there are no cadet orgs, they're still very disturbing, and I believe that they should not be legal or allowed, or at the very least, it should be very well known that these things are the case before people get involved in Scientology and get their kids involved. And even if somebody who you know gets involved in Scientology, I think it's great. The more people who know, the better, because they can tell that person, and that gives people who are inside maybe more of a clue that what's going on isn't normal, or the information can be out there when the kid eventually comes out of Scientology. Um, but an example of some of the things that still go on in Scientology to kids are they can be trained as Scientology counselors. And um, in order to do this, they are required to give Scientology counseling to people. And more often than not, they are required to give Scientology counseling to adults, wherein they're required to ask them questions of a sexual nature. And children are also allowed to receive Scientology counseling. And they are also very much allowed to be asked questions of a, of a sexual nature without their parents being there, without anyone being there to protect them. And as children, they don't necessarily know that they have a right to privacy. They are assuming because they are in a room with an adult that the adult knows better than they do, and that is not the case. One of the things that I was required to do as a kid in Scientology that is still very much something that would be required of kids in Scientology right now is what's called the purification rundown, where I was required to be in the sauna, in a sauna at 160 degrees for five hours a day for months on end. I was, had to take a handful of vitamins. I had to drink oil. It's Scientology's rundown or Scientology's procedure for getting rid of drugs in your body. Now, I didn't really have any drugs in my body, but it's the first step you have to do before receiving other counseling. And so I remember when I was doing this, when I was nine years old, my parents weren't there. Um, there wasn't anyone checking on me every day to make sure I was okay. I started getting bloody noses at the end of it. And that's something that kids are very much allowed to do right now in Scientology. And they're also required to get a doctor's checkup in order to start this procedure. But in many cases, the doctor themselves is a Scientologist, as was with me. So that's super shady. There are so many approaches that can be taken on the subject of kids growing up in Scientology, whether it's to address past evils or current evils that are currently being perpetrated by Scientology. You know, some people could take a, um, you know, why don't people sue them? Or why don't people enforce laws? Or why don't people create new laws to prevent this sort of thing from happening? Um, I personally, my role in this that I have given to myself is that I want to talk about what happened. So maybe people who are better at law creation or who are experts in that, or who are experts in other things may eventually be incentivized to do something about it. But my role here is being somebody who informs by telling my own story and potentially the story of others. My story winds up being the story of many others, but I lend credibility to the story of others by telling what happened to me because the stories are very similar. My role is not to dedicate the rest of my life to taking down Scientology and exacting revenge or anything like that. I've spent more than half my life in Scientology and it still affects me to this day. My role is to tell the truth about things that happened to me and 
the rest of my role is to live as good of a life as I possibly can because I believe that will help me and it will help other people in the best way that I can without me personally personally drowning and just reliving the past over and over again. So I hope the things that I say, the things that I bring to attention, help other people who were in Scientology feel validated for what they went through, feel that they are heard and seen, and that, um, and that it helps to stop a cycle of sort of gaslighting and minimizing and belittling people's experiences. And it can help to stop a cycle of shame and um, just the further damage and coping mechanisms that growing up in an abusive environment creates. And I hope that it can incentivize people to heal themselves and love themselves and be nice to themselves and nurture themselves and know that they have so much value and that is more where I think that my role is. And that's why I keep talking about it. Um, because I want to be a force for good in the world. And I think that by acknowledging and nurturing, I think that that's where my strengths lie. And I hope that that part of me maybe can incentivize other people who maybe have other strengths. And um, yeah. That's pretty much it. That's what's important to me in this. All right, well, I hope that wasn't just a really long rant about nothing, about me explaining why I'm doing something mostly to myself. <laughs> All right, you guys. Well, thanks for listening, and don't forget to check out Sins of Scientology on YouTube. And if you haven't already read my book, you can find it on Amazon. It's called Beyond Belief, My Secret Life Inside Scientology and My Harrowing Escape. And if you have any questions for me about Scientology or about my life, please put them in the comments. I want to start answering some of these questions again. And um, I think because I grew up in Scientology, the questions I may assume that people have are different from the questions that, they, that you actually have. So yes, please put any questions you have in the comments. All right. Have a wonderful day. Thanks again for listening. Bye.